I'm going to introduce you, for those who are not familiar, uh, with uh, some concepts of chemistry. And uh, I think chemistry rules the world, okay? Uh, when you're uh, when you're doing uh, astronomy, you're talking to gods, okay? When you're talking, you're, you're a chemist, you talk to the devil. Uh, and, uh, but unfortunately, the devil has something to say and it's worth listening. There is uh, something that you cannot necessarily say without having uh, a look at, the, at the, some constraints. And uh, you heard a number of things about uh, <coughs> Uh, chemical, oceano uh, chemical oceanography of the past. You heard about uh, the great oxygenation event. You heard about oxygen. And uh, a lot of talks, a lot of papers we uh, read actually uh, <coughs> play with concepts that uh, may or may not be uh, consistent with uh, actual observation and with basic role of chemistry. And I'm going to talk about a certain number of them um, I'm going to talk about the state, not of the the, the state of the, the art, not uh, the state of the U.S., but the state of the ocean and the atmosphere in the early day of the earth, the earth and try to introduce some relatively simple concepts, but that uh, the literature sometimes uh, doesn't uh, doesn't care too much about. And sometimes it's been invented 30 years ago and people simply forgot about them and uh, we'll see that. Uh, so I invented, I felt that there was a need to have a word describing all the science of the ocean and the atmosphere in the past, in be meaning prior to, probably not the Archean, but prior to the great oxygenation event, because the situation, as, as I'm going to try to convince you, about is uh, <clears throat> that the ocean and the atmosphere were very different from what it is today and the sim simple statements about the composition of the atmosphere and the ocean are not very interesting. The first thing I'm going to uh, uh, talk about is the, the problem of water words. Okay, As uh, Francois said uh, yesterday, um, Water words are very popular because the uh, NASA <coughs> motto is that uh, if you want to go for life, you go for water. And going for water, if you have a, 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 a water planet, is probably the, the surest thing of a failure in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, finding uh, finding life. So then. Don't, don't tell anybody because it's not very popular. Everybody's going after work. And so we have this famous movie, and uh, this is me when I was younger. <laughs> <coughs> and this is my, uh, my summer house in here. Now. <coughs> so uh, the point I'm going to develop is here that before 2.4, 2.7, we don't really know exactly. Uh, most of the word was covered by uh, by water. Uh, we had a few continents. We know, for instance, <coughs> we were talking about this with uh, with our group with Emmanuel about the Moody's in uh, in South Africa, where we know that there are continents with rivers and things like this. But most this is an observation ba made by Nick Arndt in 1998. Oh, come on, how come all the volcanic eruptions we're seeing today, maybe Komari ice, maybe any kind of ocean floor, uh, whatever was could be observed in terms of, of volcanic eruptions seem to happen under, uh, under some quantity of water. We, we had uh, Komari ice being erupted under water. We had, uh, it, it's, it was clearly something not very deep, but the Andiarchean, a lot of the eruptions were, of course, the sediments, most of sediments are, are deposited under a water column. So this is uh, the, kind of, the kind of argument uh, we had, your, uh, even though even I was, uh, was young at the time, when Peter Vell introduced the, uh, the modern stratigraphy concepts, you know, with the onlap and offering, all these things, uh, all the uh, tra transgression system, um, people thought about how inundated were the oceans. 
the oceans were under some the, the, the continents uh, actually had a coastline, and this coastline was moving, but was not moving by not much. So we have uh, the uh, alternation, alternating transgressions, and, uh, and and it was reasonably well established that what we call uh, <coughs> uh, what uh, what we call the freeboard. I'm going to come back to this concept hasn't evolved uh, much uh, around the Phanerozoic, I mean, since the, the, the Cambrian. Uh, and immediately that concept was adopted, and I was extrapolated to uh, the Precambrian and even to the Archean. But we had no clue, actually, what was actually extremely well established for Jurassic or for the Devonian actually was not documented seriously for anything. We don't know whether how much of the continents were underwater or not. And so that's the concept of freeboard. The freeboard is uh, whatever is above the, the water line on a boat, you know, and essentially the idea is that continents are in isostatic equilibrium and they float on top of the ocean. And there is always something rising above sea level if the density of the ship means a continent, is actually lighter than the, the surrounding um, mantle. So um, this is a constraint that was used in all the models. And you can see if you have the freeboard, you're not supposed to read this. It's not important. Just to tell you that even today, when I, uh, I run a Google, uh, <coughs> Google search, when I Google freeboard, I find that a lot of these uh, classical papers are coming up and uh, gave these uh, figures that we already saw yesterday, which is the mass of continents through time. And these are very popular. They're not, they're not quite consistent. Okay, you have, well, do I have a, is, does anybody has a, has a, have a pointer? I, it, it works better when it's on. Oh, yeah. <coughs> wow, it works. Uh, <coughs> so you have all these diff different models of, this is the amount of crust versus time. Here's a famous paper by Reimer and Schubert. And here's the steady state, uh, the steady state model of uh, Armstrong. But here are some other models. These ones are probably untenable in terms of freeboard. But these guys are probably, the sigmoid shapes are probably the most popular. <coughs> so how can we constrain that? Uh, this is something that was uh, right under our nose for decades. And it took uh, a, a group of three guys, I'm sorry to say three French guys, but they were in Australia. Uh, <coughs> probably uh, being far away from home helps you think. This is tritium isotopes in limestones, in carbonates. Uh, things that we think are deposited. Uh, at the bottom of the ocean, or that have been exchanging with diagenetic fluids uh, near the bottom of the ocean versus time. So we have a strontium 87, 86, and uh, when uh, uh, limestone or carbonate precipitate, we record the isotopic composition of uh, strontium, which is 86, 87, 86 strontium. And this ratio changes by the amount of rubidium, which is an alkali element, to strontium, which is a calcaline element. So in limestone, which is rich in calcium or magnesium, calcaline elements, uh, we have a lot of strontium and we have very little rubidium. So uh, the, the radioactive rubidium, uh, rubidium 87, is too wimpy, too weak to influence uh, 87 strontium because there's already so much strontium in limestone that it's gonna, not going to change much. It's kind of freezing in time the isotopic composition of the fluids. This carbonate was precipitating from, which is in general, it's a, a limestone. It can be dolomite, it can be calcite, it can be siderite. And what we think, what we see here, this is the strontium isotope evolution versus time. And what we see here is the evolution of the terrestrial mantle, which is this red line here. And what we see here is that with time, with time, the difference here between the mantle and what is the ocean, which means the crust, because the, we, you're going to hear that a lot today, 
the ocean is actually controlled in terms of strontium isotopes by the by the by rivers. Okay, and what we see here is that this interval between the crest, where we have a high rubidium strontium ratio, take a granite, a granite has K feldspars, it has micas, and the rubidium strontium ratio is pretty high. So the the, the relative abundance of uh, strontium 87 moves very fast, and the ratio 87 86 gets higher and higher through time. In the mantle, the rubidium strontium ratio. The alkali over calcaline ratio is fairly low, okay? so this ratio doesn't move very far, very fast. So we have the difference between the oceanic uh, 87 strontium, 87, 86 strontium, and the mantle value here increases through time. And the convergence point that people advocated for, it has been discussed by, this is the Shields and Weiser compilation here, and that actually goes back down to something like a 2.6, 2.7, 2.8. We don't know exactly because it's hard to find carbonates that have been preserved uh, and have been, have, didn't go through diagenesis, but overall we can say that here we have a, a, a mantle-like uh, seawater, and here we have a crest-like seawater. So we can explain that in a relatively simple way. Uh, what is the strontium cycle in the ocean? This is something extremely important. I have to make a some level of cell citation, okay? It's, uh, <laughs> otherwise I don't look very serious. <coughs> So strontium comes from the river, this is a river runoff here, and goes away uh, into limestone, is precipitated with limestone here. And we have a machine which is called the hydrothermal system, the black smokers or whatever, that takes the strontium from the ocean, you inject it into mid, mid ocean region, and is actually uh, spouting, as, uh, spouting out as a, as a black smoker, as hydrothermal solutions here. And with the mantle value, let's say here it enters, or today these uh, fluids enter into the ridge with the 87, 86 strontium value of 0 0.709 and actually exits the, from the uh, mid ocean ridge black smokers with values of 0 0.703 and it's quite detectable. It's, it's a very strong signal. So we have this machine here and strontium, we actually, what we measure with strontium isotopes is the balance between hydrothermal activity and, uh, and runoff and erosion and uh, uh, chemical erosion. Okay? This is, uh, if, you have an, if you have a no continent, you're bound to have a mental value. If there is, like today, or like uh, 600 million years ago, 550 at the end of the Pan-African orogeny, we have a very high 87, 86 uh, strontium ratio, which means that there is a lot of er uh, chemical erosion going on, which means that for uh, today it's Himalayas, in, back then it was the Pan-African mountains, and you can tell the ratio because between hydrothermal activity and chemical erosion here. <coughs> so, uh, this is something that uh, Maybe it works better here. So what uh, uh, what uh, Nicolas Flamand and uh, his uh, co-workers in, uh, in Australia uh, say, well, this is not, uh, people were talking about uh, crustal growth. This is nothing to do with crustal growth. This is just a ratio of continents and uh, continental uh, presence above uh, sea level, because to have erosion, you must have the continents being above sea level. We don't have a rivers running in, in the ocean, okay? Uh, that's, that's fairly obvious. And uh, <coughs> we have, uh, the, what they say, it's not the uh, crustal growth that we're seeing here. We're seeing that there is no, there is actually very little uh, continental surface, I mean, uh, Siberia continental surface prior to the great oxygenation, oxygenation event, and there is a lot of it afterwards. Continents started rising above sea level at 2.4, 2.5, something like this. So that's the beginning of erosion here, which is important here. <laughs> so it has been known, and I remember I was uh, a UH, age, uh, was uh, visiting, visiting a Gordon conference in New Hampshire, and it was still the, uh, some one of these living gods called Bob Garrels, was advertising for this very nice picture that people tend to downplay for obscure reason here. So it's the abundance of the different rock types versus age. This is today, this is uh, five billion years ago, 
And here, you, uh, no, this is, uh, this is the opposite. This is today here, and this is 4.5. No, this is uh, age. Yes, that's the age. That's today, sorry. So today we have a lot of carbonates, limestone, dolomite here. Back then, we didn't have any. That was an observation made by a Russian compilation in 1964, which is actually wrong today, but not that wrong. There are some carbonates in the Archean. There are some carbonates in South Africa. There are some carbonates in, in, uh, uh, <coughs> in Australia. But the amount of it, look, at, look seriously at the literature, the amount of it is extremely small. And they all shelf sediments. Nothing is deep, uh, something like uh, basin carbonates. It's all, that's where you find these beautiful stromatolites, okay, beautiful uh, that John Grotzinger and other people have been describing over the years. The amount of carbonates in the past was extremely small. It means that uh, the amount of CO3 2 minus in the ocean was very small. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a very, uh, this is one of them here. This is uh, John Grotzinger's uh, picture. I mean, he's a uh, student. Uh, a seminar here, and you see these carbonates with structure here, supposed to be some uh, some bugs. So probably, what 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 is it? What do you think is a it's a stromatolites or whatever here? Actually, when you plot the rare earth in there, you see that even these carbonates have a, actually they are a mixture in terms of carbonates. It's a very nice uh, mixing or perbola here between detrital carbonates and hydrothermal carbonates. Even here, you can feel the hydrothermal, the, you have a, it smells of, uh, of hydrothermal activity, even in those carbonates. This is, uh, this is quite funny. You can make the point very, very strongly. So uh, the, we have another type of evidence, which is seeing isotopes, something uh, uh, <coughs> done by one of uh, our grad students, in, uh, by a PhD student in Lyon. And this is the zinc cycle. Zinc has isotopes 64, 66, 67, 68. And these isotopes are fractionated by a number of things, including biological activity. When they are not fractionated, so you have uh, here zinc coming out as dissolved and detrital here into the ocean. Here, it goes in estuaries. Here, there are some uh, uh, isotope fractionation. And again, we have uh, some mid ocean ridge uh, hydrothermal activity. We have sedimentation here. We can make a cycle here. And when you look at the zinc isotopes between now and uh, 4.5 billion years ago, it's actually not 4.5, but it's probably Isua, it's probably here. Uh, this is South Africa, this is, uh, and what you can see, if you, this gray band here, this is H, this is now, this is then, okay, uh, this gray band here is detrital zinc, zinc, uh, the proportion of isotopes 66 and 64 in uh, uh, clay minerals, in uh, volcanic rocks, in, the, it doesn't change much, zinc is not, is a very essential element to life, but it doesn't change. And what you can see here is that you have a detrital component all the way to, to, to the great oxidation event, and then it takes a dip, and it, go back, it goes back up during the, during the great oxygenation event, and goes up to a modern value, which is actually influenced by biological activity, and by the fact that biological activity needs an input from the from from continents to uh, to have some some zinc and to so we have the in the f the first soils that's what is telling you here is that the first soils are actually developing around 2.5 2.6 the first abundant soil don't take me wrong there were some continents there were some volcanoes but you see the difference here you have the detrital value it takes a dip it goes up here and it, it's these are manganese nodules you know they're pretty high there is something else so subaerial continents are modified by biological activity and it shows in zinc isotopes <clears throat> so what should we remember from this bottom line subaerial continental expenses are much smaller in the Archean compared to today I'm not saying that there is no, I'm saying that there is less, okay. <coughs> Something now which is quite obvious is the ocean, what I call the ocean factory here, where we have elements, where do they come from, where do they go, and now they go back to the first point. First, try to think about a water planet, what does it look? 
what we, when we think of uh, the ocean today, it's controlled by geology, essentially controlled by geology. The fact that plate tectonics has broken up the Americas from Eurasia and Africa, and we have a north-south north -south ocean. And the thermohaline circulation, this is a famous uh, uh, plot by, by Wally Broker, transcribed actually, Wally Broker died uh, one or two weeks ago, so probably the person who influenced me the most in terms of uh, low temperature geochemistry. And you have water sinking in the, no in the Sea of Norway, going, following this, uh, this path here and going back at the surface uh, here. This is the famous conveyor belt. And you see the Gulf Stream, something like the Gulf Stream here, which is, as I was discussing with Francois yesterday, the fact there is a Gulf Stream on the west and no Gulf Stream on the east is related to the, to the, the rotation, to the spin of the Earth and to the conservation of, of, uh, of angular momentum and uh, the friction against that thing. So all these things uh, look like this, you know, it looks so natural to us that we think of this, uh, of this uh, uh, physical oceanography in the past in the same term. But <coughs> movements, actually, this is something, maybe you're going to read it, actually something that you can check. So you've taken the very nice papers by Carl Wunsch and his collaborator, Ferrari and all these guys here from the MIT group. And they say, well, what is mixing the ocean? It's not thermohaline circulation. It's actually, it's actually, sorry, it's actually wind, you know, wind stress at the surface. It's actually gravity wave inside. The fact that you have a different density, what you call baroclinic, uh, baroclinic instability. And you start having mixing in there, have turbulence, a vertical mixing. It is what mixes, what actually accounts for the balance of kinetic energy in the ocean is not thermohaline circulation. The ocean are not mixed by thermohaline circulation. They, they're mixed by winds. They're mixed by what you call Ekman pumping. The fact that when uh, you know that it is upwelling, when you, the wind f uh, blows over the sea, the water goes to the right because of Coriolis forces, and then it makes some kind of a hole, and, and water comes back up at the next to the surface. So that's that's the, that's that's the detail of the of the mixing. So if we have a if we have an ocean word, what would uh, so we have here the, the Ekman layer, which is something like a 50 meters thick, where you have the effect of wind, or you can feel the effect of wind, and underneath it has to be mixed up by general circulation and by uh, uh, baroclinic instability in the ocean. So what would uh, the, the circulation of, uh, of an ocean look like? It would look like this. It would have nothing to do. It would be a zonal circulation. Remember these nice pictures of Jupiter? That's what it looks like. You know, that's in an ocean. Today is controlled by, by continents. If there is no continent, circulation has nothing to do. So it's mixed, but it's mixed in a very different way. And uh, all, the, all the logic we have, <coughs> so it's a, a very efficient mixing. This idea that uh, you have a zone and stagnant ocean, you know, it's just nonsense. You know, people say, oh, maybe the ocean was layered. No, no, it doesn't, it's not layered because it's unstable. It's unstable because wind is pushing at the surface. And, and mixes up everything. And there is some evaporation somewhere, and there is rain somewhere else. There's a difference density in the water columns that creates some instability in the ocean. So there is circulation in there. So we have uh, some, uh, some things here. The main sources of elements today are what? Rivers and hydrothermal vents. We have been there already. No, no need to. Where are the sinks? The sinks are chemical, these are manganese nodules, these are biogenic, this is chalk, and uh, this is detrital here, you have clays, uh, you have flesh, you have uh, all kinds of things, and we have a bind ion formation, which are chemical deposit, uh, dip, uh, like a sea, or, or church. Church in general are diagenetic, but uh, most beef are chemical sediments, and again, we have another sink in hydrothermal vents because we inject. 
uh, uh, seawater is injected into hydrothermal uh, vents, into hydrothermal systems, and is actually exchanging with the hot basalts and is actually expelled by, uh, by the system. So if we have a system with uh, Siberia continents, a system with uh, uh, continents under sea level is extremely different. We have a calcium and magnesium carbonate forming because here there is a reaction between rain, CO2 next to the surface. We have a calcium magnesium carbonate, 87 strontium excess, as I was telling uh, earlier. And uh, after the 2.3 uh, giga years, weathering is extremely strong. Chemical weathering is extremely strong. When this, is, this guy is standing stupidly under the surface of the ocean here, there isn't much going on because there is no river. Okay? And uh, so uh, the, uh, the essential of the chemical activity is concentrated <coughs> here. So that makes a huge difference. So what do we want to remember from this? No continent, no runoff, no rivers. Well, it's a big, uh, it's a big uh, uh, we have to be intelligent to say that. Hydrothermal vents must be those bringing electrolytes to the ocean. Okay. Now the story I like, a, a word with a very little phosphate. The Archean had a, had a phosphate problem. And this is what I was alluding to yesterday with Francois. Phosphate is a very useful animal. We use it. We have a nutrient. It's the master of, the, of life, essentially. This is the cycle of phosphate. You don't want to focus on this, but uh, that there is phosphate in uh, DNA. Uh, there is phosphate in uh, ATP. I mean, ATP, that's the currency, energy currency of life rest on PO4 twice and PO4 th uh, three times. You have ADP, ATP, but it's all about phosphate because it's a most energetic uh, reaction which is uh, common in the, at the surface of the Earth. So we need a lot of phosphate. No phosphate, no life. Nobody has ever been able to produce for, uh, any sort of life without, without phosphate so far. So we have a phosphate in DNA, in ATP, and in a lot of enzymes that are critical, like alkaline phosphatases, that controls the volume of the cell and that controls the, the proton pump, that controls the potassium sodium exchange. You have all the things that depend on phosphate phosphatases, so it's extremely important here. So phosphate is used massively by life. So here is nitrate, here is phosphate, and uh, different levels in the ocean. Okay, surface ocean has essentially no, surface ocean has essentially no phosphate, deep ocean has a lot of phosphate. Why? Because we have energy at the surface of the ocean. We have a photosynthesis, so we need a lot of new uh, uh, catabolism, we knew a lot of metabolism, and, and every, everybody needs phosphate. So it's a nutrient, it's, an, it's a limiting nutrient, life-limiting, bio-limiting nutrient. So we see that the deep water, uh, the surface water has no phosphate, while the, whereas deep water has a lot of it, because when uh, organic material falls down, there is uh, always someone scavenging that material, that is, they are repackaging phosphate and uh, putting it back in circulation. Okay, this is uh, absolutely obvious. When you look at the cross section of the ocean here, and you see the uh, the phosphate here, you see this is north, this is south. These are all the cross sections of the Atlantic Ocean. You see that injection of surface water into uh, into the north into the Atlantic, actually quite visible in the phosphate level, and it goes hand in hand with oxygen consumption. That's uh, something which is depleted in phosphorus and which is high in oxygen. Okay, oxygen because you, the surface water is well ventilated. We have a lot of oxygen, uh, but we have no phosphate. <coughs> So, phosphorus cycle looks relatively simple. You derive a phosphate from continents here, and phosphate precipitates down in sediments. There is no other place to go. We cannot invent phosphate. Can we uh, make it uh, from 
other sources than continents? No, the answer is clearly no. If we have, if we today we look at uh, uh, the input or removal of phosphate from the ocean, of the rivers. Rivers are a positive flux. They introduce phosphate into the ocean. And then people tried desperately for decades since the John Edmond in 1979 demonstrated that actually black smokers were a sink for phosphate and not a source, since other people demonstrate that low temperature alteration at the bottom of the ocean is a sink for phosphate and not a source, we have a problem. It's not something, oh, maybe people, it's not, a, it's not, a, this is an illusion, this is what I was discussing with Francois, yeah, it's nothing to do with democracy, people writing that there is, there is something, uh, oh, maybe there is some phosphate there, and, uh, no, there is none here, <laughs> zero. Okay, uh, you can uh, take all the votes you want. There is no phosphate coming out from the ocean floor. What do you do with this? Okay, rivers plus submarine hydrothermal vent minus rich flanks minus. So what do you do with the with the ocean? We have an, we had a number. And don't tell me that there was a phosphatic event or all of a sudden. I took the same data as uh, Reinhardt's uh, in Reinhardt's database, who was claiming that there was a rise of phosphate at the GOE. Oh, come on. doesn't work that way. This is phosphate, person phosphate in marine sediments through time. Where is the GOE here? You don't know me neither. You see a, 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 a continuous evolution of phosphate here through time, which indicates that little by little, uh, uh, continents rise above the surface. This is how it works. Okay. Bottom line, no continent, no phosphate, no life. Simple to remember. So no plate tectonic, no life. Too much water, no life. Are ah, we in trouble here? Now let's talk about iron. Let's talk about the iron soup and uh, tell you about the Archean Ocean. So, so far it was simple. Now it's becoming a little more complicated. Evidence of oxygen isotopes from sulfur isotopes demonstrated that there was no oxygen prior to the great oxygenation event, not because of its name, but because of uh, delta, because the excess of uh, sulfur 33, a rare isotopes, which is produced, you know, when you have a uh, natural process, processes are the, going on in the ocean, on continents, whatever. Fraction is what you call mass dependent. If you see an effect, uh, an isotopic effect before between 34 and 32 sulfur, you would expect that the effect on 33 and 32, which is the difference of mass, which is 50%, would be half of it. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quantum mechanics, this is something which has been verified for 70 years with no problem. So it's the <coughs> uh, mass fractionation, uh, mass uh, isotope effects vary linearly in principle with the difference in mass between isotopes. Here we have something else. We have a photolytic dissociation of SO2, volcanic SO2, in the stratosphere. And this is not a normal reaction with, uh, uh, <coughs> it, it is something very different. We, you break a number of molecules and you're proportional to the number of molecules. You're not proportional. You're not, pro uh, this, the reaction doesn't act in proportionality with the mass, it acts in proportionality with the number of molecules. So like a self-shielding in, in space, it's the same idea. So we start having an excess of the small guy, sulfur 33. And James Farquhar made one of the, probably the most significant discovery of the last decades. It's a great guy, this thing. Is and uh, at 2.4, we have, until uh, from 3.8 to 2.4, there is a mass independent fractionation, which is due to the effect of UVs uh, on SO2. And it tells you one simple thing, there was no ozone, because ozone is actually, actually stops uh, UV radiation. If there is no ozone, it means that there is no oxygen. 
because oxygen is made. We need you need oxygen to make ozone, so very convenient. So until and at uh, 2.4, it comes to an end. There is no mass independent fractionation anymore. It means that there is ozone in the atmosphere, so it means that there is oxygen. This is a very simple observation. Okay, well, yeah. <clears throat> let's talk about another element now, which is iron in the ocean. Very simple. I told uh, almost uh, every single visitor last night of one thing: iron two is a soluble uh, form of iron. You know, ferrous iron, ferric iron, iron three is totally insoluble. Why? Because we form what, what is formed is uh, iron hydroxide. In different forms. You can have a ferric hydride. You can have a hematite. You can have a, a, a gutite. You can have all kinds of things, but it's totally insoluble. Iron-3 is insoluble, so if the atmosphere is oxidized, iron is in the form of iron-3. If there is no oxygen, we are, iron is in the form of iron-2+, of iron and it's highly soluble. So uh, today we still measure a little bit of iron. There is not much. This is a very, very small quantity in, sp in spite of what you're saying. And you see that iron is actually uh, being emitted here. Uh, uh, by the mid ocean regions by the vents here. This is a paper by Chris uh, German. And you see that uh, iron is, uh, is emitted as iron 2 and progressively oxidized in the hydrothermal plumes in the ocean. Manganese is as the, same, as the same issue. Manganese, manganese actually has this, the, the highest signal to noise ratio. But iron is very very difficult to measure, so people don't use it, but we use manganese because we can measure it very easily. So there was a time there was a lot of iron around. And you saw my rocks yesterday, you saw this abandoned iron formation. They were pretty nice. Cool. Okay. This is the largest resource for iron today. And these are different, uh, different uh, cores taken in, uh, this is Hammersley here. This is the Transvaal. They all look more or less the same. And uh, we had a student running, like a number of people did it before her, uh, <coughs> Fanny Thibault measure iron isotopes, which has been measured for the last uh, 20 years, essentially. But the idea we had was different. We want to understand the residence time of iron in the ocean back then. If you know, if, you, if something, if an element is extremely reactive in the ocean, it's not going to stay very long. This is the issue with pollution. You know, when an element is a polluting element, is a polluting element, and polluting because it actually enters the biological cycle, it means that it's going to disappear very quickly. If an element is, uh, is of nobody's interest, Let's take chlorine, sodium. Nobody cares about chlorine and sodium. I put some in my soup, but this is okay. It doesn't change uh, the, drastically the, the budget of uh, sodium and chlorine in the ocean. Uh, and uh, so these elements are actually a very long residence time because they are the guys, they're, they're, they're wallflowers, okay? Uh, <coughs> they're, they're left behind and they So, okay, you have, uh, the idea was to measure this and the interpretation of these bands of uh, iron formation are, are multiple. People have been fighting for 50 years about this. Okay? And uh, the issue is that if we want to f uh, make a, so what is a band of iron formation is largely made of magnetites. Magnetite is iron 2 plus iron 3, Fe3O4 three is one iron 2, one iron 3. I told you no oxygen, all the iron is in the 2 plus form. How do we oxidize iron to make iron 3? So there is a nexus electron here. What do you do with this electron? Who wants my electron? Uh, nobody wants it. No nitrate because there is no oxygen. No sulfate because there is no oxygen and everything is changed to sulfur, to sulfide. There is a bit of HS minus, but this is not much, and actually precipitates as an iron sulfide. So there is no electron acceptor around. The only one, oh, life. Life. Okay, we have a life. So 
Uh, people really love this, uh, this uh, life idea about band and ion formation to oxidize the... So oxidation, uh, the first interpretation, the oldest one by oxidation, uh, dissolve ion2 in deeper boiling ground with photosynthetic oxygen produced by cyanobacteria. Cool. Another interpretation is metabolic of, uh, oxidation of iron 2 by anoxygenic phototrophs. So, Gerald's here, Kornhauser, Widow, <coughs> life again. And then, uh, this is a bio based interpretation. And there is something which is not bio based, is UV photooxidation of iron 3, of, uh, of uh, iron 2. UV from, uh, from the environment, breaking down water, okay, you have this reaction here, produce, you take uh, some H plus and you put some energy from uh, UVs and you produce two F and you had, uh, actually there is production of hydrogen. Very popular interpretation. Actually, I would say it's probably the dominant interpretation. The problem is, we here we have uh, millimoles of iron, millimoles, okay? Tens of millimoles of iron in the ocean. It is enormous. How much, uh, how much H plus do we have in the ocean? In a neutral ocean? Um, what's the concentration of H plus? What is the definition of pH? The concentration of H plus. So H, a pH of 7 means 10 to minus 7 H plus. So you want to uh, oxidize uh, 10 to minus 2 by 10 to minus 7. That doesn't sound very good. Okay? So there is a problem. So problems with 1 and 2 is biology here. The problem is that if we want to have biology, as I told you, there is nothing you can do about biology if the, you don't have phosphorus. There is no phosphorus in, in uh, there is no phosphorus in uh, in bananine formation. There are ten hundreds of ppm. This is nothing compared to modern sediments. There is no phosphorus, and even the sedimentation rate is very uh, very slow. We don't have a phosphorus in bananine formation. There is no organic activity. Oh, maybe it comes from continents. It comes from continents. No, it doesn't work because we have a very low content of detrital components. So no aluminum, no scandium, no titanium, no, no, no zirconium, no nothing. We in the band and I formation, I've been told they work. Oh, you see the continental edge and you see a base in here. Come on, forget it. There is no aluminum, there is no detrital material. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's in a word, it's an ocean word. Okay, it doesn't work. You might have some volcanic eruption, a little bit of volcanic eruption. But with the amount, it doesn't work. And I'm, this is not my idea. This has been spelled out very clearly by, these two, by this guy here in 1989, 1990 again. And everybody tends to forget it. Oh, he has to say that, well, yeah, but we can have a phosphate anyway. I can have a of, uh, aluminum anyway. No, you don't have it. It's very consistent. So, and as I told you, okay, the, the, the hypothesis number three, not enough H plus, unless the medium is fairly acidic. If you're ready to have an ocean with a pH of, 10 to, uh, of two or three, like Coca-Cola, a Coca-Cola ocean, that's okay, you can probably, but uh, we haven't gone that far yet. So what uh, Fanny Tibon did was to actually measure iron isotopes. Okay, mass of iron. What is the residence time? Is the inverse of the probability of exiting the system by unit time. If I say that one of you is uh, living uh, or in a room every hour, okay, uh, this is the probability. I can tell you that the residence time is the number of people let's say 40 here, divided by the rate of living is 1 per hour. So I can get a residence time, which is going to be the residence time of 40 hours in room. This is the same thing. There is no secret on this. So you can calculate in a relatively simple way, with the assumption that the water flux to ridges didn't change too much by more than 
rate of, uh, let's uh, forget about the change of uh, hydrothermal activity, let's put a factor of two of uncertainty on these uh, changes in hydrothermal solutions here. This is not, a, so what we do essentially, we're looking for some, we have uh, some input and we're looking for a, 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 a delta function input. We have uh, one thing, you know, we have at some point there is a discontinuity. We introduce at one point a big amount of, of iron because of, for instance, a volcanic eruption. And we see how long it takes for this uh, input to disappear in the system. We call that the E folding time, the, the residence time, the relaxation time of iron. You have, it has different words, okay? And you can see how much an iron, an iron atom spends in the ocean before it gets uh, out of the system. So we can put some nice equation. We use the cobalt chronometer, which is the rate of an element. This element is known to, the, to actually sediment at a very constant rate. Uh, the people, you can use that in the modern ocean very easily. And you can actually confirm that this chronometer is consistent with uh, other types of chronology, like zircons in the, in the ocean. So let's let's try. We can argue about this, but uh, trust me, this cobalt chronometer is consistent. And we got this uh, kind of. Uh, there should be a delta here in front of uh, the 60 here. That's the uh, isotopic anomaly here. You have uh, the scale is 0.25. It's two. Uh, what is here? 0.15. It's uh, 0 0.150, 0 0.15, this is a small thing. But you see the relaxation time with H here is uh, very slow. It takes forever for iron to get out of the system. The system contains a lot of iron. So we have a, really an iron soup in the, in the system. A residence time of 2 million years is here. <coughs> And uh, we can calculate with the flux, hydrothermal flux, I'll come back to this. We can calculate how much iron it makes for the ocean. We have, we're talking about 1 to 50 millimoles of iron. So it's dark brown. It's like the lakes in uh, Biscarros and all these places here. You know, they're, they're, really, they're really brown. <coughs> so this is the pre-GOE ocean contains something like 6 to 35 millimoles per kilo of iron 2 plus. So now let's try to be a little more quantitative because so far it's been just playing around with numbers. <coughs> and uh, let's try to figure out what the difference between the ancient ocean and the modern ocean was. This reality, the answer is actually, you can summarize it with one word. So this word is alkalinity. This is my buzzword, my own buzzword. Not, I'm not the only one. I love it because it controls the word. So what is alkalinity? I don't know if you can read. Can you read whatever is in red here? Yeah. No. OK. Post-GOE. Now, OK. Alkalinity is the sum of sodium. It's the number of positive charges minus the number of negative charges for ions that are fully dissociated. Sodium, calcium, magnesium, uh, whatever for positive for uh, cations, and uh, and uh, you have one for chlorine minus one for chlorine minus two for sulfate. So the difference between these two guys here is called the alkalinity. It has to be equal to uh, carbonates, the sum of charges carried by carbonates, which is HCO3 minus and CO3 two minus. It's relatively simple. Okay, all the plus charges must balance the all the the, the, the minus charges. Okay, that was the situation in those days. They in today. Why is it important? Because if you want to, some people think, oh, I can calculate the PCO2 from the pH. Wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And you know, I got some reviews where people were saying this. this is, Come on, give me a break. This is uh, so you can write all these equations here, and you have a, you can say that PCO2 cannot be calculated from pH. Why? Because of alkalinity and alkalinity. 
this is Wally Broker's equation. You can find them everywhere, PCO2. Don't tell me, oh, I went to ZB's book and I used the... Okay, of course, he makes the assumption that the alkalinity is the modern alkalinity. So I have a PCO2. Of course, it's a function of the pH here. But it's also a function of alkalinity, a strong function of alkalinity. So depending on how much... I don't know if you ever tried to squeeze a lemon in a bottle of fizzy water, Perrier. So if you squeeze the lemon and you have all the bubbles evolving. Why? Because uh, they the carbonates that are dissolved as carbonates. When you see all these H plus coming, they have to go out because there is no room for carbonates. So they go out as CO2. This is, a, this is a very simple. Okay, but in back then, back then what was the situation? Alkalinity, this one you can probably read a little better. The sum of here. What disappears? No sulfate. No sulfate, no magnesium. Magnesium goes into the rock at any temperature above 50 degrees. If you find today, we discussed that with Puri last night, if you find magnesium in hydrothermal vents, it has to be mixture with seawater or with, with, uh, with uh, any uh, brine or anything like this. You put uh, any kind of rock in contact with the, with the solution containing magnesium, magnesium instantaneously goes into the rock. So there was no magnesium because it cut, there is no river. And here, so there is no magnesium, probably, so we left with uh, sodium, calcium, and iron. So we just found in the absence of calcium, magnesium, sodium, the alkalinity fluxes to the ocean. So the control of PCO2 is accounted for by iron. As I like to say, iron, uh, iron, uh, abandoned iron formation were the ancient carbonates. So today, alkalinity is regulated by carbonates. Because you remove calcium, two charges, two, or two, two plus, and you remove a CO3, two minus. So you keep the balance right. You introduce alkalinity by the reaction that the Francois showed yesterday. You have a reaction of CO2 plus silicates or plus carbonates, and you introduce the carbonates and calcium into, into the ocean. You remove it by precipitating calcium and carbonates. Back then, there was no carbonate. There was no... So what, uh, what can we do here? The, what is accounting for alkalinity was iron, essentially iron. Iron and chlorine. Of course, there is chlorine here and uh, probably HS minus. So if you try to understand what is alkalinity, this is uh, uh, something from my book. So the alkalinity, this is uh, in, in, we call it in milli equivalent per, per kilo here, calcium, magnesium, potassium, Sodium accounts for most of it, and the negative here is sulfate and chlorine. The difference I can is the black thing is the, is the sum here in between. Back then, all is left is sodium, iron, and chlorine. It was totally different. So don't tell me that you can say anything about PCO2 in the ancient ocean. You have no control of this. Well, find some control. So Archie and iron play the modern role of calcium and and carbonates today to regulate ocean alkalinity and therefore to buffer pH of the ocean. Uh, you can calculate the amounts of you have uh, here phosphate, uh, pressure of CO2, CO3 to minus, pH, CO3 to minus, and this is alkalinity. Okay? Depending on the alkalinity, you have a very, very different answer. By order's magnitude, this is not a factor of two, it's by order's magnitude. Tell me which ions you put in the ocean, I'll tell you how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. So, what do we remember? What do we have to remember from this? Beef were the equivalent of modern carbonates. That's why there is no carbonate in the, in the Australian rec in the, in Archean record. Okay, well, I was saying, well, what you're saying is uh, hydrothermal vents uh, uh, regulating everything, but how, what do we know about hydrothermal vents? We understand them very, very well, and I'm going to show you. Where I'm going to show you. So, I promised I would. So, what's the temperature of hydrothermal vents? You know, today, most of mid-ocean ridges are 
between 2500 and 3500 meters below sea level is the given pressure. And forget about salt, it makes a small difference. But this is depth, this is temperature. And this is the seawater boiling point. Here you have this plot here. And a typical more pressure, uh, the, the mid-ocean ridge uh, uh, pressure is around here. This is the critical point. So most of the boiling point are, most of the boiling point are around 400 something, which is interesting. Because if you look at uh, uh, thermal expansion, you know, uh, you increase by one degrees the temperature of the environment and you check the volume, how the volume changes with temperature. That's the thermal expansion. When you come close to the critical point, which is the case here, what's going on is that the, uh, the water just expands brutally. Okay? And you can see it here. This is alpha. The term equation of thermal expansion is temperature. It explodes here. That's why all the hydrothermal vents we know today erupt at temperature between three, 300 and 420 or something like this. It's just a matter of pressure. Temperature is controlled by pressure. This is, this is all. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, well understood. Um, maybe here. The other part of the problem is what's, what is the result of water rock interaction? And uh, if I take a basalt and cook it in the microwave or in the mid ocean ridge with uh, salty water, with uh, seawater, what do I get? I get a rock which is called a metamorphic rock. And most of these rocks associated with hydrothermal vents are what we call in the green schist phases. Temperature around 250, 300 degrees. This is green, this is boring, this is chloride, this is epidote, this is albite. This is, there is a reaction between seawater and you put enough water, you have the things. And you say, well, this is complicated. I don't want to deal with this. No. People have been doing some calculations. This beautiful paper by Terry Bowers and, and Hutel here. And this is the transformation coordinates. This is, uh, this is no transformation here, and this is fully transformed. Uh, here, this is uh, between 1% uh, and between 5% and 100% and, uh, and, uh, transformation. What is the metamorphic assemblage of a, uh, of a metamorphic basalt? You recognize all things, chlorite, epidote, albite, paragonite, uh, but it's a special kind of basalt here, and tremolite. It's an amphibole. So what can we do with this? We can do a lot, okay? So this is a typical mineral phases. We have chlorite, paragonite, epidote, clinozoizite, which is epidote, another form of epidote, albite, talc, tremolite. So let's write a number of equations here. Uh, what controls, you can take any reaction you want, you can write anything equation you are in between minerals and water, and try to understand what's going on in the other thermal system. So I took some of the equations that may actually control, if you take another one you won't change because it's thermodynamic equilibrium. If you take another mineral you're going to get the same result. You don't care about which mineral. Okay? As long as you have the temperatures determined, you have this. So this is an amphibole plus chloride plus H plus, then epidote plus silica plus water plus iron. So you're not very good at chemistry, I understand that. Uh, are you? No. Okay. Ah. <laughs> so you understand that when you write the equilibrium relationship, this activity of this one is a solid is one, this activity is one, the activity is one, the activity is one, and this one is taken care of in the constant of equilibrium. So essentially what we get for a ferroactinolite, which is the amphibole, is essentially that iron 2 plus divided by uh, H plus square, because we must have the num same number of charges, is equal to a coefficient that depends on temperature. 
Do it again for calcium. Amphibol, another type of amphibol, magnesium amphibol, plus epidote, plus H plus, plus chloride gives silica, calcium here. What you write, you have an equation, so activity one, activity one, activity one, activity one, and you're left with, epi with, left with H plus and calcium. So you get calcium over H2 plus. And you have a K, another K here, which is temperature dependent. And uh, the same thing for sodium. You can take albite, uh, you can take, a, uh, you can take a actinolite, you can have a, a number of things like this. And you can determine one by one the equilibrium constant for all these reactions and determine from what the geologists call the paragenesis. Now from the paragenesis, you can calculate the composition of water as a function of the temperature. So it's good, we knew that for a number of years. And uh, this guy, Jean Michard in 1992, pointed out something relatively simple. He said, well, the charge balance, which is the alkalinity balance, okay? This is the iron two plus calcium plus sodium minus chlorine is equal to alkalinity. This guy is a small guy. Alkalinity is very small, 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus whatever. It doesn't matter. Chlorine is 0 0.5, 10 to 0. So you don't care whether, uh, what, whether this one is small or not. And then you change iron 2 uh, using the previous equations. Okay? You change iron 2, change calcium, you change magnesium, you change everything you have. And you get that kind of equations here, H plus, H plus, chlorine. What you see is that the composition of seawater is control of, of, the, of the hydrothermal water is controlled by two things, temperature and chlorine. Chlorine is not going to change by more than, let's say, a factor of two, three. We don't know how chlorine changed through time. It did change through time, okay? But uh, we can see here that we have this equation, or we can take a complexation constant into account. But here is the log of the concentration here and log of, of chlorine here. More chlorine you have, the more pluses you should add to compensate for chlorine. Of course, this is why the pH is increasing. There are more H plus. Magnesium increases, calcium increases, sodium increases, uh, whatever potassium increases here. And uh, what, this is what, what you have here. So we know that uh, hydrothermal vent composition could not have changed drastically because pressure uh, and boiling temperature are determined by the depth of the ocean. And everything is controlled by, uh, by the chlorine content of the ocean, which cannot have changed by orders of magnitude. Okay? We know what uh, went into the ocean. So bottom line is that the chemistry of deep hydrothermal fluids did not change drastically through time. And now I'm going to pass to uh, go on to another aspect of things in the, and uh, try to find out what's going on with the atmosphere. And as I told you, we're in, we in pain with finding an electron acceptor if we refuse that it has to be biological activity. But it doesn't mean that there isn't. And an obvious electron acceptor, an electron exchange, is CO2 versus methane. So we can write a nice equation, CO2 plus Fe2 plus, uh, CO2 plus Fe2 plus, plus some water, water never, never hurts, gives magnetite plus methane plus H plus. And I don't know why nobody has ever calculated that reaction before. This is funny, okay? And so you can uh, you have all the thermodynamic constants. So the CO2 CH4 ratio in the atmosphere. This has been published two months ago in uh, EPSL, okay? And it depends on what? On iron two, and depends on H plus. We don't care about the activity of magnetite. Is one? It's a solid phase. So you can write that the CH4 CO2 ratio is actually a function of pH the amount of iron 2 in the ocean, and some constant that you can. So what you can see here is that even minute variation of pH in the iron 2 ocean produce enormous variation of the methane to CO2 ratio. Change the pH by one unit. Always remember pH is a log scale. So it's a factor of 10. 
change the pH by a factor of two, okay, here, you get six orders of magnitude in the change of the methane CO2. This is enormous, okay? And so you can get it here, you have a pH and you have the CH4 CO3 ratio and depending, remember, we were somewhere around here with the millimoles, we probably somewhere here. The pH is probably at seven, something like this. It means that the methane CO2 ratio in the atmosphere in equilibrium with magnetite is huge. There is essentially very little CO2 in the atmosphere. You're going to find that shocking as yeah, come on, it must be bullshitting me, but uh, no, no, it's not. You can tell from the equilibrium here, I had the three chemists checking my equations and uh, they say it is right. So because I was so enormous that I, I was kind of afraid. Above an iron ratio in the atmosphere is rich in CH4 and not in CO2. So the ocean atmosphere carbon cycle becomes very different. Modern one. CO2 in the atmosphere, it rains on continent, we have a carbonate, so we have a flux of alkalinity in the ocean, and we're losing uh, alkalinity by precipitating calcium carbonate. Yeah, this is, uh, we're happy with this. But back then, in the Archean, there is a CO2 CH4 equilibrium here, and precipitating magnetite. But the atmosphere is made of CH4. It has to do with the atmosphere. If there is no oxygen in the atmosphere, if we have a lot of methane in the atmosphere, there are lots of consequences. In the modern Earth, what's the fate of methane? So we have uh, ozone here in the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere, interacting with UVs, producing oxygen plus uh, atomic oxygen here. H2O reacting with, ox uh, with uh, O and producing hydroxyl. That's what we have today. Hydroxyl, we, and there's all kinds of reactions here, but essentially hydroxyl reacts with methane. Uh, you produce uh, uh, methyl first in H2O, and methyl reacts with oxygen again, and in the end you, fin you, in, you end up with uh, CO2 plus H2O. That's why the methane residence time in the atmosphere is in the order of 10 years because it's destroyed but and so the cows can do whatever they want eventually the their, their products are going to be oxidized okay yeah the end of the line but back then no oxygen what do we do oh that's different we have the methane here reacting itself with the uvs there is no oxygen there is no ozone layer producing methyl here but there is no oxygen to oxidize it to bring it back to CO2. So we produce the CH3 and so we produce, uh, uh, <coughs> we don't have, if we don't have oxygen or liquid uh, water absence, it's the, it's the <coughs> situation on Titan and we have a CH3 reacting with all kinds of things and we start producing uh, ethane, we start producing all kinds of hydrocarbons and it rains oil. On, 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 uh, you have uh, oil lakes, oil seas in Titan. Uh, in the Earth, it was probably different because we could still produce uh, some OH and produce uh, some methyl here, no oxygen, liquid water present, and we still would produce a lot of uh, methane and ethane and propane and all things like this in the atmosphere. It was raining oil. And this is an idea, it's not my idea, it's an idea by two famous guys, but I'm thinking uh, Tony Lasaga and, uh, and Dick Holland in the, 19, in the 70s, who already said, well, there must have been something like a 10 meters of oil on the surface of the ocean. <coughs> what do we do with this? So it is uh, something extremely important that no oxygen in the atmosphere means that the atmosphere is not dominated by CO2 but is dominated by methane and if there is methane there is oil everywhere and uh, uh, geological observation in the Transvaal South Africa in uh, in uh, uh, Australia you find all these uh, shelf carbonates these shelf carbonates actually contain a lot of kerogen as inclusions they're wrapped in kerogen there is kerogen everywhere associated with limestone. This is not a dream.
Okay, there is a there is a paper by Roger Buick entitled "A Massive Production of Hydrocarbons in the Archean." That's the was the title of his paper, 1996. So this is not a dream. So we have we have to make room for that kind of situation, and not I mean the idea. Oh, CO2 and nitrogen, that's nice for, to, uh, that's a good start for planets. No, it's not. It's not because rocks are going to. So, what can change the whole thing is if we go to uh, small planets, like a Ganymede, like a, because the gravity is much smaller. If the gravity is lower, the composition of hydrothermal vents is going to be very, very different. The composition of, gravi of, the, of the vent water is going to be very different. So it's worth today going back to these outer planets with the very small gravity field and see how they interact with their, with the, the, with their rocks and decide what kind of chemistry we're dealing with. So uh, it's, I think essentially the, what you want to remember, the pre-GOE atmosphere was dominated by methane. It's, uh, it's big enough to stop there. And so uh, I think I'm going to thank you and uh, take a few questions before I run back home. <laughs>